What's this? A letter for me. Welcome to another episode of Remember the Great Sports. Today I have three returns that I'm going to share with you. So uh, I'm pretty sure they're baseball. I've been sending a lot of baseball out lately, so it, uh, I'm, if I was going to put money on it, that's who we're probably looking at. So let me just hop right in here and see what we got. All right. Um, the first one is from former Pittsburgh Pirate great Jeff Keane on one, two, three, and four. And I got one on that beautiful 1991 Fleer. There are a couple YouTubers out there that uh, are trying to collect that set. So not sure if you uh, have Jeff King yet or not. But uh, he is in that set if you uh, need him. Uh, unfortunately, he didn't use the uh, boldest Sharpie. It looks like uh, on each card the Sharpie just died a little bit more with the... 91 Fleer one looking like the best best of the best there, but nonetheless. Thank you very much for signing those mr. King a little bit about Jeff King uh, He was drafted in the first round of the 86 draft by the Pittsburgh Pirates out of the University of Arkansas So a former first round pick um, He was a third baseman primarily, but also played first base uh, throughout his career, and I believe a little bit of second base as well uh, when he got to the majors. So um, he spent a few years in the minors after the draft. Uh, he first got his official taste of the majors in 1989 as a rookie, where he didn't have the best season, but in 1990, uh, the Pirates more or less gave him the opportunity, and he hit 14 home runs in 1990, his kind of sophomore slash rookie season with the team. Uh, in 1991, however, he only appeared in 33 games for the Pirates, so I'm going to assume that he probably got injured that season. Uh, I don't know that for a fact, but from smacking 14 home runs and playing some pretty decent third base, I wouldn't see why you would have lost your job the following year other than injury. Because in 1992, he bounced back, appearing in 130 games, where he again hit 14 home runs. So, from 1989 to 93, he kind of had so-so eh, seasons. Uh, I take that back to 1994. But in 1995, that was when you kind of saw the glimpses of him shooting upward. And 1995... He batted 265 and hit 18 home runs for the Pirates. Well, the following year, in 1996, he busted out 30 home runs while batting 271 for the Pirates. The following season, he hit 28 home runs. The following year, 24 home runs. Well, after his 30 home run season, the his first 30 home run season, the season where he hit his most home runs, the Kansas City Royals signed him at 32 years old, where he went to Kansas City and played in obscurity <laughs> once again because he was in Pittsburgh, then he went to Kansas City. And he uh, basically repeated the same season. Uh, his batting average was a little bit lower, but he did hit 28 home runs, then 24 home runs. But in 1999, he only appeared in 21 games, uh, which again probably leads me to think that he was injured because he was at 34 years old and there are no stats after the 1999 season. So I'm going to assume after his 11th season in the league, he called it quits. So in total, Jeff was a lifetime 256 bat, uh, batting average and hit 154 home runs. I do believe he played on Team USA collegiately. Yes, that does indicate that he did that. And now that I think about it, I have a Team USA card that I probably should have sent instead of one of these in its place. So, oh well, <laughs> it happens. Uh, we'll move on, and maybe if I decide to write them again, I'll have to try to remember to send that Team USA card. So, thank you, Mr. King. Really appreciate it. Welcomes additions to the collection. All right. Ironically, what are the odds of this? I opened a second package. And this is of Jeff's former teammate, 
with the Pittsburgh Pirates. And he signed one. This is John Lieber on one, two, three, and a upper deck vintage makes four as a Chicago Cub. Now, who is John Lieber? Uh, John Lieber was a college draft pick out of, is that Southern Alabama? University of South Alabama or Southern Alabama? South Alabama. So, excuse me if I said that wrong. Um, he was drafted in the second round by the Pittsburgh Pirates. Actually, I take that back. He was drafted in the second round by the Royals. So he originally was a Royals draft pick. However, I do not think he ever played for the Royals. No, not in the majors at least. So Lieber was a second round pick uh, of the Royals in the 92 draft. Uh, he worked his way up through their system. This is actually him in his collegiate uniform. And that would be him probably in rookie ball with the Royals affiliate. Just look on the back. Yep, there it is. See the Royals logo right there. So he was traded by the Royals, and I will try to see if I can find that really quick. So we will cut this. All right, so sorry about that quick cut. I just wanted to look up my transactions and get it right. Uh, he was actually originally drafted by the Cubs, but he chose not to sign in the 91 draft, but then was drafted the following year by the Royals in the second round and chose to sign because they gave him a better offer. But in 1993, so he spent one year with the Royals organization. In 1993, the Royals traded him with Dan Maselli to the Pittsburgh Pirates for Stan Belinda. And if you're a Pittsburgh Pirates fan, Stan Belinda may be a sore spot for you. <laughs> so I think we can definitely say that uh, the uh, Pirates got the better part of that deal. That's the most diplomatic way I can say that. Um, so, after Lieber was traded to the Pirates in the 93 season, the following year, 1994, he was in the major leagues with the Pirates, where he went 6-7 and seven over 17 starts for the Pirates. Um, he spent uh, the latter part of 1994-98 to 98 playing for the Pirates as a starter, and uh, he had some so-so seasons. You know, nothing, nothing too spectacular, but in 1998, between the 1998 and 99 season, he was traded from the Pirates for, to the Cubs for Brant Brown, who was an outfielder on the Cubs in 1998. Well, in 1998, he was part of the pitching staff of the Cubs, and I don't think this is a 98 card, but there he is as a Cub. He started for the Cubs in 99. He won 10 games and lost 11. Then in 2000, he won 12 games and lost 11. Then, at the age of 31 years old, in 2001, something happened. Miraculously, John was able to turn his career around, and at 31 years old, he won 20 games as a starter for the Chicago Cubs. He went 20-6, and six, appearing in his first All-Star game as a Chicago Cub, and had an ERA of 3.8. I mean, that, that's an amazing turnaround. You know, this is a pitcher that never won more than 12 games, you know, an entire season. And then in 2001, he put it all together. Well, unfortunately, 2002 wasn't a follow-up to that. Uh, he went 6-8 and eight, um, the following year. Uh, with a pretty similar ERA. Well, in 2004, uh, he went to the New York Yankees. Uh, the Cubs let him go after his season that he didn't match the 20-6 and six record, and the New York Yankees gave him an opportunity. So the Yankees signed him, and he went out and played for the Yankees for a season and went 14-8. So he got the magic back a little bit for the Yankees, and spent the 04 season with them. Well, he was a free agent after that season, so the Philadelphia Phillies took a risk on him, and they gave him a three-year deal, and he responded at 35 years old in 2005,
going 17 and 13. So the second most wins of his career came at the age of 35 years old. And then he followed up the 06 and 07 campaign with not so great records. And in 2008, he returned to the team where he had his most success, the Chicago Cubs. And at 38 years old, after the 08 season, Mr. Weber decided to retire. So overall, uh, John had 130 wins and 124 losses, an ERA of 4.27. But that one season, the 20 and 6 season, which was magical to him, was one of the best years that any pitcher could ever have. So thank you, Mr. Weber. I really appreciate you signing for me. All right. So this last one, I believe, is a former Philadelphia Philly great because it's postmarked from Philadelphia. And it is indeed a very important person in Philadelphia Phillies lore. And I will save that card for last. <laughs> and that is Mr. Tommy Green. Tommy Green on one, two, three, four, and finally number five with his no-hitter inscription on a no-hitter card, May 23rd, 1991. And I wrote him a letter and I graciously asked him, Mr. Green, on the no-hitter card, would you mind inscribing no hitter and putting the date and he obliged so let's talk a little bit about tommy green if you're a philadelphia phillies fan you definitely know who tommy green is um i was uh doing a little research for this video and it turns out that he is currently one of the color analysts for the philadelphia phillies to this day so if you watch the post game show for the phillies Apparently he does, you know, the post game. So, so there are people that uh, I'm sure are huge Phillies fans, especially with their young talent that they got coming up through their system. Uh, but Tommy Green is a very knowledgeable baseball man, from what I understand, and uh, a big Philly supporter. Uh, so Tommy Green originally was drafted by the Atlanta Braves in the first round. 14th overall, um, and worked his way up through their system. Uh, he came out of high school. He was a high school kid that signed. And <clears throat> apparently his nickname was Jethro. I don't know anything about that, but uh, if any of the viewers can elaborate on how he got his nickname, that'd be interesting. Um, he worked his way up through the Brave system, and in 1989, at 22 years old, he found himself... Uh, starting for the Atlanta Braves. Uh, he only appeared in four games that year for the Braves, and he uh, concurrently the following season made the team, but only appeared in five games overall, so that tells me that he was in the minor leagues, both in 89 and 90 primarily. So, as a young, unproven pitcher, after two seasons with the Braves, he was only 24 years old, and during the 1990 season, the Atlanta Braves chose to trade him with longtime Atlanta Brave great Dale Murphy to the Philadelphia Phillies for little known reliever Jeff Parrott. Now, Jeff Parrott was a reliever for many years, but hardly somebody that you would think you would get in return for the likes of Dale Murphy. So not only did the Phillies get Dale Murphy to finish up his career, they also got a player to be named later, which that player later to be named, named later was Tommy Green. Well, Tommy Green took this opportunity because if anybody knows who the Braves were back in the 1990 season, you kind of know who their pitching staff was. And it was kind of probably hard to break that pitching staff with, with uh, Tom Glavin, John Smoltz, and Steve Avery, um, along with the other pitchers that they had on that team. I want to say Charlie Liebrandt was there at the time. Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, but they, they, they had a stacked minor league system with some good young arms with Glavin and Smoltz for sure. 
So the Braves saw Tommy Green as expendable. Well, Green uh, finished out the year with the Phillies, but in 1991, at 24 years old, he got the opportunity to become a starter. And this is where he shined the most. Now, he didn't particularly win the most games of his career that year with the Phillies, but the most notable thing that he did was coming out of obscurity and throwing this no-hitter in May. Now, after that season, um, the Phillies made their run for the World Series, as you guys know, in 1993, and that was actually the season that Tommy saw his best career going 16-4 and as a starter for the Phillies. Well, the following year, 1994, it, uh, the season was, you know, strike shortened, but it also appears that Tommy had some injuries as he only appeared in seven games that year. In 95, after the strike had ended, he came back and just was not the effective pitcher that he was at only 28 years old. After the 1995 season, the Phillies and him parted ways, and he signed with the Houston Astros trying to make a comeback and was unable to do so. And after the Astros let him go, he did sign with the Atlanta Braves one last time to try to make it a go and was unsuccessful. So in closing, uh, I go back to being courteous and polite. You know, asking for something cool like this to be inscribed on your item, and he definitely obliged. Thank you, Mr. Green. Thank you, Mr. Lieber, and thank you, Mr. King, for adding some great autographs to my collection from guys that I literally grew up watching. That was when you guys were all in the prime of your career, when I was, you know, a young man watching baseball, loving the game. So thank you to all three of you for contributing to my addiction of collecting autographs. Uh, join me again for another episode, and I look forward to your comments below, especially you Phillies and Pirates fans. Thanks.